The Siberian presents Kull, the Conqueror, and the Screaming Skull of Silence by Robert E. Howard. And we just courtesy of unsplash.com. Audio samples courtesy of YouTube Audio Library. Disclaimer. The following may contain violence, references to sex, and language that may affect. And a dozen death blots blotched him, on jowl and shank and huckle, and he knocked on his skull with his knuckle, and laughed, if you'd call it laughter, at the billion facets of dying, in his outstart eyeballs shining. Men still name it, the day of the king's fear. For Cull, king of Valusia, was only a man after all. There was never a bolder man, but all things have their limits, even courage. Of course, Cull had known apprehension and cold whispers of dread, sudden starts of horror, and even the shadow of unknown terror. But these had been but starts and leapings in the shadows of the mind, caused mainly by surprise or some loathsome mystery or a natural thing, more repugnance than fear. So real fear in him was so rare a thing that men mark the day. Yet there was a time that Cull knew fear, stark, terrible and unreasoning and his marrow weakened, and his blood ran cold, so men speak of the time of Cull's fear. And they do not speak it in scorn, nor does Cull feel any shame. No, for as it came about, the thing rebounded to his undying glory. Thus it came to be. Cull sat at ease on the throne of society, listening idly to the conversation of two chief counsellors, Kanu, ambassador from Pictum, Brul, Kanu's right-hand man, and Cuthulus, the slave, who was yet the greatest scholar in the Seven Empires. All is illusion, Cuthulus was saying, all outward manifestations of the underlying reality, which is beyond human comprehension. Since there are no relative things by which the finite mind may measure the infinite, the one, may underlie all, for each natural illusion may possess a basic entity. All these things were known to Rama, the greatest mind of all the ages, who aeons ago freed humanity from the grasp of unknown demons and raised the race <sighs> to its heights. He was a mighty necromancer said Kanu. He was no wizard, said Cuthulus. No chanting, mumbling conjurer, divining from snakes' livers. There was not of mummery about Rama. He had grasped the first principles. He knew the elements, and he understood natural forces, acted upon by natural causes, producing natural results. He accomplished his apparent miracles by the exercise of his powers in natural ways, which were as simple in their manners to him as lighting a fire is to us, and as much beyond our ken as our fire would have been to our ape ancestors. Then why did he not 
Give all his secrets to the race, asked Tu. He knew. It is not good for man to know too much. Some villain would subjugate the whole race, nay, the whole universe, if he knew as much as Rama knew. Man must learn by himself and expand in soul as he learns. Yet, you say all is illusion, persisted Kanu. Shrewd and statecraft, but ignorant in philosophy and science, and respecting Cthulhu for his knowledge. How is that? Do we not hear and see and feel? What is sight and sound, countered the slave, is not sound, absence of silence. And silence, absence of sound. The absence of a thing is not material substance. It is nothing. And how can nothing exist? Then why are things? Asked Kanu, like a puzzled child. They are appearances of reality. Like silence. Somewhere exists the essence of silence. The soul of silence. Nothing that is something. An absence so absolute that it takes material form. How many of you have ever heard complete silence? None of us. Always there are some noises. The whisper of the wind. The flutter of an insect. Even the growing of the grass. Or on the desert the murmur of the sands. But at the center of silence there is no sound. <sighs> Rama, said Kanu, long ago shut a specter of silence into a great castle and sealed him there for all time. I said Bro, I have seen the castle, a great black thing on a lone hill, in a wild region of Volusia. Since time immemorial, it has been known as the Skull of Silence. Ha! Cull was interested now. My friends, I would like to look upon this thing. Lord King, said Cthulhus, it is not good to tamper with what Rama made fast, for he was wiser than any man. I have heard the legend that by his arts he imprisoned a, a demon. Not by his arts, say I, but by his knowledge of the natural forces. And not a demon, but some element which threatened the existence of the race. The might of that element is evinced by the fact that not even Rama was able to destroy it. He only imprisoned it. Enough! Cull gestured impatiently. Rama has been dead so many thousand years that it wearies me to think on it. I ride to find the Skull of Silence. Who rides with me? All of those who listened to him and a hundred of the Red Slayers, Valusia's mightiest war force, rode with Cull when he swept out of the royal city in the early dawn. They rode up among the mountains of Zalgara, and after many days' search, they came upon a lone hill rising somberly from the surrounding plateaus, and on its summit, a great stark castle, black as doom. This is the place, said Brule. No people live within a hundred miles of this castle, nor have they in the memory of man. It is shunned like a region accursed. Cull reined his great stallion to a halt and gazed. No one spoke, and Cull was aware of the strange, almost intolerable stillness. When he spoke again, everyone started. Right on. To the king it seemed that waves of deadening quiet emanated from that brooding castle on the hill. No birds sang in the surrounding land, and no wind moved the branches of the stunted trees. As Cull's horsemen rode up the slope, their footfalls on the rock seemed to tinkle drearily and far away, dying without echo. They halted before the castle that crouched there, like a dark monster, and Cuthelus again essayed to argue with the king. Cal, consider, if you burst that seal, you may loose upon the world a monster whose might and frenzy no man can stay. Cull, impatient of restraint, waved him aside. He was in the grip of a wayward perverseness, a common fault of kings. And though usually reasonable, 
he had now made up his mind and was not to be swerved from his course. There are ancient writings on the seal, Cthulhu's. Read them to me, he said. Cthulhu's unwillingly dismounted, and the rest followed suit, all save the common soldiers, who sat their horses like bronze images in the pale sunlight. The castle leered at them like a sightless skull, for there were no windows whatever, and only one great door, that of iron and bolted and sealed. Apparently the building was all in one chamber. Cull gave a few orders as to the disposition of troops, and was irritated when he you found he was forced to raise his voice, you and seemingly in order for the commanders to understand him. Stay here. The others surround and patrol. Their answers came pickets. dimly and indistinctly. He approached the door, followed by his four comrades. There on a frame beside the door hung a curious appearing gong, apparently of jade, a sort of green in shade. But Cull could not be sure of the colour, for to his amazed stare it changed and shifted, and sometimes his gaze seemed to be drawn into great depths, and sometimes to glance extreme shallowness. Beside the gong hung a mallet of the same strange material. He struck it lightly and then gasped, nearly stunned by the crash of sound which followed. It was like all earth noises concentrated. Read the writings, Cthulhu's, he commanded again, and the slave bent forward in considerable awe, for no doubt these words had been carved by the great Rama himself. Mm -hmm. That which was may be again, he intoned, then beware all sons of men. He straightened, a look of fright on his face. A warning, a warning straight from Rama. Mark ye, Cull, mark ye. Cull snorted and drawing his sword. Ho! Oh. Rent the seal from its hold and cut through the great metal bolt. He struck again and again, being aware of the comparative silence with which the blows fell. The bars fell. The door swung open. Cuthalus screamed. <laughs> Cull reeled, stared. The chamber was empty. No, he saw nothing. There was nothing to see. Yet he felt the air throb about him as something came bellowing from that foul chamber in great unseen waves. Cuthalus leaned to his shoulder and shrieked. <laughs> and his words came faintly as from over cosmic distances. This silence, this is the soul of all silence. Sound ceased. Horses plunged and their riders fell face first into the dust and lay clutching at their heads with their hands, screaming without a sound. Cull alone stood erect, his futile sword thrust in front of him. Silence, utter and absolute, throbbing, bellowing waves of still horror. Men opened their mouths and shrieked, but there was no sound. The silence entered Cull's soul. It clawed at his heart. It sent tentacles of steel into his brain. He clutched at his forehead in torment. His skull was bursting, shattering. In the wave of horror which engulfed him, Cull saw red and colossal visions. The silence spreading out over the earth, over the universe. Men died in gibbering stillness. The roar of rivers, the crash of seas, the noise of winds, faltered and ceased to be. All sound was drowned by the silence. Silence, soul-destroying, brain-shattering, blotting out all life on earth and reaching monstrously up into the skies, crushing the very singing of the stars. And then, cull new fear, horror, Terror overwhelming, grisly, soul-killing, 
Faced by the ghastliness of his vision, he swayed and staggered drunkenly, gone wild with fear. O oh gods, for a sound, the very slightest, faintest noise. Cull opened his mouth like the groveling maniacs behind him, and his heart nearly burst from his breast in the effort to shriek. The throbbing stillness mocked him. He smote against the metal sill with his sword, and still the bellowing waves flowed from the chamber, clawing at him, tearing at him, taunting him like a being sensate with terrible life. Kanu and Cuthulus lay motionless, two writhed on his belly, his head in his hands, and squalled soundlessly like a dying jackal. Bro wallowed in the dust like a wounded wolf, clawing blindly at his scabbard. Cull could almost see the form of the silence now. The frightful silence that was coming out of its skull at last to burst the skulls of men. It twisted. It writhed in unholy wisps and shadows. It laughed at him. It lived. Cull staggered and toppled. And as he did, his outflung arm struck the gong. Cull heard no sound, but he felt a distinct throb and jerk of the waves about him, a slight withdrawal, involuntary, just as a man's hand jerks back from the flame. Ah, old Rama left a safeguard for the race even in death. Cull's dizzy brain suddenly read the riddle. The sea. The gong was like the sea. Changing green shades, never still, now deep and now shallow, never silent. The sea. Vibrating, pulsing, booming day and night. The greatest enemy of the silence. Reeling, dizzy, nauseated, he caught up the jade mallet. His knees gave way, but he clung with one hand to the frame, clutching the mallet with the other, in a desperate grip. The silence surged wrathfully about him. Mortal, who are you to oppose me, who am older than the gods? Before life was, I was, and shall be when life dies. Before the invader's sound was born, the universe was silent, and shall be again. For I shall spread out through all the cosmos, and kill sound, kill sound. Kill sound, kill sound. The roar of silence reverberated through the caverns of Cull's crumbling brain in abysmal, chanting monotones as he struck on the gong again and again and again. And at each blow, the silence gave back inch by inch, inch by inch. Back, back, back. Cull renewed the force of his mallet blows. Now he could faintly hear the faraway tinkle of the gong over unthinkable voids of stillness, as if someone on the other side of the universe were striking a silver coin with a horseshoe nail. At each tiny vibration of noise, the wavering silence started and shuddered. The tentacles shortened, the waves contracted, the silence shrank. Back and back, and back 
and back. Now the wisps hovered in the doorway, and behind Cull men whimpered and wallowed to their knees, chins sagging and eyes vacant. Cull tore the gong from its frame and reeled toward the door. He was a Finnish fighter, no compromise for him. There would be no bolting the great door upon the horror again. The whole universe should have halted to watch a man, justifying the existence of mankind, scaling sublime heights of glory in his supreme atonement. He stood in the doorway and leaned against the waves that hung there, hammering ceaselessly. All hell flowed out to meet him. From the freight thing whose very last stronghold he was invading. All of the silence was now in the chamber again, forced back by the unconquerable crashings of sound. Sound concentrated from all the sounds and noises of earth, and imprisoned by the master hand that long ago conquered both sound and silence. And here, Silence gathered all its forces for one last attack. Hells of soundless cold and noiseless flame whirled about Cull. He was a thing, elemental and real. Silence, the absence of sound, Cuthulus had said. Cuthulus, who now groveled and yammered empty nothingness. Here was more than an absence. An absence whose utter absence became a presence. An abstract illusion that was a material reality. Cull reeled, blind, stunned, numb, almost insensible from the onslaught of cosmic forces upon him. Soul, body and mind, cloaked by the whirling tentacles. The noise of the gong died out again. But Cull never ceased. His tortured brain rocked, but he thrust his feet against the cell and shoved powerfully forward. He encountered material resistance, like a wall of solid fire, hotter than flame and colder than ice. Still he plunged forward and felt it give, give. Step by step, foot by foot, he fought his way into the chamber of death driving the silence before him. Every step was screaming, demonic torture. Every foot was ravaging hell. Shoulders hunched, head down, arms rising and falling in jerky rhythm. Cull forced his way, and great drops of blood gathered on his brow and dropped unceasingly. Behind him, men were beginning to stagger up, weak and dizzy from the silence that had invaded their brains. They gaped at the door, where the king fought his deathly battle for the universe. Brill crawled blindly forward, trailing a sword, still dazed, and only following his stunted instinct, which bade him follow the king, though the trail led to hell. Cull forced the silence back, step by step, feeling it growing weaker and weaker, feeling it dwindling. Now the sound of the gong pealed out and grew and grew. It filled the room, the earth, the sky. The silence cringed before it. And as the silence dwindled and was forced into itself, it took hideous form that Cull saw yet did not see. His arm seemed dead, but with a mighty effort, he increased his blows. Now the silence writhed in a dark corner and shrunk and shrunk. Again, a last blow. All the sound in the universe rushed together in one roaring, yelling, shattering, engulfing burst of sound. The gong blew into a million vibrating fragments and the silence screamed. Thank you for listening. The 
This has been a Siberian production of Robert E. Howard's Cull the Conqueror. The Screaming Skull of Silence. For updates, follow Pain Studios on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Images courtesy of Unsplash.com. Audio samples courtesy of YouTube Audio Library. You can find some of our stories on Bandcamp. To download and keep ad free. Please like, comment, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell of the Siberian YouTube channel. And if you're feeling generous, buy us a copy to support our work. All links in the description. <laughs>